Thank you, everyone. So thank you to everybody for coming out. We have a great crowd here. Our nurses, our technical staff, people from the device clinic, hospitalists, cardiologists, hospital administrators. It's a great crowd. Um, this is the view from 30,000 feet. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? What are the programming choices that we're making trying to benefit our patients the most? So rather than pondering through some of the very fine details, let's look at this from a very big picture and have a nice scope of understanding of what we're trying to accomplish in electrophysiology and specifically in the realm of cardiac devices, pacemakers, defibrillators, resynchronization um, devices, and even loop recorders for cardiac monitoring. And like Cressa said, take any opportunity to ask questions. Um, this is a time to really just talk about things and flush out what we need to understand and um, concepts that are, may still be challenging. And believe me, all this took me a long, long time to figure out. Um, and I'm still figuring it out. And the field is moving at warp speed. And you'll see that. And we're all struggling to keep up and understand what's available so we can help our patients the best. That is becoming my labeling, Heart Dr. Jim. I tweet on this. I have a Facebook page, lots of information, headlines. I send them out every day. And you'll see if you just follow the headlines of what's coming out in our field, you'll start to get caught up on what the relevant issues are and the direction the field is moving. And um, even just participating in that can be very exciting and keeping on top of what's happening in the field of electrophysiology. So if you care to follow me, care to follow along, I'll let you know that I'm doing it. And um, when I'm in between cases on my phone, I'm usually forwarding some kind of article to my um, sites. So take advantage. So first of all, let's talk about pacemakers. This seems like it should be a very simple thing. In fact, pacemakers can be um, exceedingly complicated as we try to understand what our patient's rhythm abnormality is and how we can address that with a device. So pacemaker indications, you know, rather than the detailed society guidelines, when should you ask for help with your patient with um, bradycardia? So any symptomatic bradycardia, if you think someone's suffering because of their slow heart rate, heart block pauses, what have you, that is a time to think about pacemaker therapy or any concerning bradycardia. You're not sure the patient's suffering, but you are worried about slow heart rate, the possibility of block and the possibility of pauses. It's an appropriate time to reach out and um, ask someone to weigh in and perhaps think creatively about how to solve someone's problem with the use of a pacemaker. So very simple. Here's somebody with complete heart block, easy to see on the ECG, clearly deserves a pacemaker if the ejection fraction is preserved. And so here we see um, a pacemaker. I know we implant a lot of devices. I may be the only person to look at the x-ray on everyone post implant, but I want the x-ray on every patient to look exactly like this. And as you know, I plan my implant procedures to get that result. And that is a pulse generator that's over the lung field, nice and medial, no interaction with the arm. Patients should never be aware that it's there. And then we look for appropriate lead slack. And as you know, in our cases, we're always trying to guesstimate what the appropriate lead slack is at the time of implant so that when the patient stands up in front of the camera, it, it, it looks like this. And you see these two leads here passing through the vein one looping up nicely into the right atrial appendage and this one riding across the tricuspid valve annulus, uh, which is here into the apex of the right ventricle and then curving upwards into the septum so that it's in a safe position never to cause perforation and to engage um, the cardiac conduction system as it paces. So as we're fussing in the lab, that's always the result I'm thinking about and trying to, and trying to achieve. The field is moving at warp speed, as we said. What is the latest in pacemakers? We have rate response pacer, pacemakers trying to guess what heart rate is appropriate for the patient and provide that heart rate. Most pacemakers use what we call blended sensors, accelerometers. The pacemaker can tell if you are moving, whether that's on an escalator or actually you're exercising. And then minute ventilation, it senses you breathing, the depth of your ventilation, how fast you're breathing, and it says, oh, he must be trying to exert, I'm gonna speed up. So pacemakers are guessing. There's another pacing modality, closed loop stimulation, which tries to feel cardiac contractility. If you want a faster heart rate, your heart muscle is probably beating more forcefully because you have catechols, and that will augment your rate based on contractility. 
We have pacemakers now that can not only tell us about atrial fibrillation, but can actually try to treat atrial fibrillation, function like defibrillators in that regard in the top chamber, very exciting. And we have MRI compatible pacemakers. We know that probably any pacemaker can withstand an MRI just fine. The problem is without the labeling, radiologists get, won't get reimbursed, so they don't want to do it. So you can't get the study done. In fact, they are safe, but there are pacemakers with that labeling, so it's not a glitch on, in, in regard to having the study performed. <laughs> MRI compatible both for dual chambers. We know Medtronic has had this for a long time. Now Biotronic has it. The other companies are falling closely behind. And interestingly, single chamber. If you want a single chamber MRI compatible pacemaker, the only one on the market today is the Biotronic. The Medtronic requires two leads to have its MRI conditional um, labeling. And finally, every pacemaker is a monitor. And that's very important that we can monitor patients' rhythms, their heart rates, correlate symptoms with rhythms and heart rates through their pacemaker. So as soon as you implant someone with a device, you know everything about them going forward, which is very important for uh, management. So here's this concept of a blended sensor. We have activity sensors. It senses you moving. That um, performs very nicely at rest when you start to accelerate. And then when you get moving and you're really exercising, you'll start to breathe harder and sort of the minute ventilation sensor will take over. So hopefully by blending these two, we come up with the appropriate heart rate for the patient and um, we pace them. And of course, all that is programmable. Here's this business of sensing cardiac contractility. You can see in diastole that the muscle surrounds the pacemaker lead tip like this. During systole, that's a little bit tighter. And the lead can sense the impedance in the blood pool around it and gets a sense that the heart's trying to beat more forcefully, and it will sense that and try to speed you up in response. Perhaps physiologic in certain scenarios where you are not moving fast and you are not breathing fast, but nevertheless, you would like to have a faster heart rate. Let's look at that in the context of vasovagal syncope. This is something we treat with pacemakers often. What happens when someone has a vasovagal faint? Um, so here we see your systolic blood pressure, your diastolic blood pressure, your average blood pressure, and your heart rate at the time of the faint. And you can see that as your blood pressure falls because your veins are dilating, initially your heart rate will also fall. Paradoxically, it should speed up, and that's the reason why you're crashing. So what happens is you have dilation of your blood pool, all the blood rushes to your legs, your heart will give a very forceful beat in response to that, sort of an exaggerated response. And because it did that, your autonomic sensors say, oh, if you're going to beat that forcefully, we got to slow you down because that's very forceful. And so then your body ramps down the heart rate and the combination of the two results in the faint. Perhaps if we could sense that forceful contraction and augment pacing, we would do a better job for vasovagal syncope. So in a DDD pacemaker mode, we go through peripheral venous dilation, a vigorous heart contraction, the autonomic system adjusts, the heart rate decreases, and only when the heart rate decreases and the person is falling will the pacemaker will then kick in and accelerate. With another pacing modality, we may sense that vigorous contraction and start augmenting heart rate up here before the blood pooling has occurred and before the patient passes out. So uh, depending on the patient's need for pacemaking, we can select programming options that best meet the need of that individual. So it's not just so simple to say this person needs a pacemaker, let's just give them a pacemaker. We really have to think through what their problem is and make the programming selections to, to best meet their needs. So that's something we're always trying to do. Here's an example. You see a lot of this, you know, love pink. You respond to that because it says love pink, but there's nothing pink. And in fact, your heart rate with us sitting here will accelerate in a response to that mental frustration because we have frustration, we increase our catechols, and your heart will actually speed up. For somebody with a pacemaker to do that, you're not breathing faster yet, you're not moving. Um, perhaps one of those contractility sensing pacemakers could augment you here. Here we see in one man, a 54-year-old man, physiologically, um, chronotropically incompetent, he gets a pacemaker to speed him up, and here is a heart rate um, distribution profile that you would get from a DDDR pacing mode, and you could compare that for the same level of activity with the CLS pacing mode. And 
Now you can try to guess which one of those heart rate histograms looking differently is appropriate for this gentleman, and perhaps you can do serial testing and find out what is exactly suiting him the best and make your programming choices um, accordingly. So these things actually do make differences. Pacemakers can treat atrial fibrillation. Here's someone who was referred to me for an ablation of atrial fibrillation. Here's his compass trend as we go month to month to month to month. Here's his burden of AFib. You see he has a lot of AFib. The last thing his cardiologist did before he referred him was turn on atrial ATP. So now the pacemaker is going to try to burst pace him out of his atrial fibrillation. They turned it on here. You can see he has no more atrial fibrillation. And he shows up in my clinic saying, I'm great. I'm not having it anymore. I'm just fine. And, you know, it's like, well, you referred to me for this. Clearly, you don't need it because your pacemaker is solving this problem for you. And here you can see in the top chamber that burst pacing taking place and putting the patient um, back into normal rhythm. So pacemakers behaving like defibrillators. Um, it's a new and interesting prospect in the field. The MRI compatible pacemakers, the single chamber MRI compatible pacemaker, the first one available on the market, we have the distinction of implanting the first one in the United States. In Europe, they're way ahead of us, but we got it first in the United States. So that's kind of a big deal that happened here at Cadillac. And there are times when that can be an appropriate um, scenario. Here's a 32-year-old female. She had, was hyperthyroid, had sinus tachycardia. Um, she had five ablations of her sinus node performed um, not in our center and actually had a pacemaker for two years, which then was removed because it was dysfunctional. And she comes to us complaining of um, symptoms of slow heart rate. Now her thyroid has been removed. She's euthyroid and she's very concerned about her bradycardia. We gave her a seven day monitor and there's her heart rate distribution. And you say, well, this doesn't look like somebody who needs a pacemaker. They have completely normal heart rates. If you look at the individual tracing, she's got all these pauses. So she'll go at a normal rate, and then it's like there's a sinus node exit block, and she'll pause, and she's very symptomatic. She notices those things, and she's concerned that her heart will actually stop beating. So there's some mental anxiety there. And uh, she has, in fact, driven her car um, off the ditch. So she gets a single chamber atrial pacemaker. And you can see a single lead in the atrium in the atrium, there's nothing in the ventricle, and we see if this is gonna solve her problem. Rationale, she's young, minimum hardware, because hardware over the decades of her life to follow could have problems, so we wanna minimize. Um, here's our incision, her first pacemaker was way too high, it impinged on her clavicle. We put one a little bit lower, careful to preserve the tattoo, <laughs> and um, which people appreciate. And then f after five days of pacing, this heart rate histogram becomes this heart rate histogram. Which one of these is healthier? They both look very good. In fact, um, her symptoms were completely resolved here. The pacemaker is still learning about her physiology 30 days from now. I'll update this slide when it's available because this is so new. This is even going to look differently and hopefully will be even a bit of refinement in terms of the patient's needs. Um, but we have these exciting options available to us. Pacemakers are monitors. I love them because they are monitors. Here's someone who came in with symptoms of dizziness and hypotension, got a pacemaker, I implanted it, had the same symptoms. The pacemaker was, said she wasn't going too slow. In fact, she was going too fast. She had SVT. We took her to the lab, ablated her for AVNRT, and um, solved her clinical problem using the pacemaker, in this case, as a monitor to help us make the diagnosis. Should she have bradycardia, the pacemaker is there, but we really solved her problem based on the pacemaker, which was a problem of too fast rather than um, too slow. So let's move on to defibrillators. We pl implant a lot of these in our program. The problem is sudden cardiac death. 350,000 people in the United States drop dead suddenly and unexpectedly. That's 43 victims per hour. So in the time of our presentations here, we can think that 40 people in this country will die suddenly. 20% um, survival, um, uh, so it's a big problem. What is the problem? And this is what Dr. al is gonna speak on. The problem is coronary disease and unstable plaque. If you have plaque that has plaque rupture, thrombus will form on that plaque, giving you an acute occlusion, which will give you an acute infarction, which will form a scar, which will predispose you to arrhythmias. And then at random times, even if your ejection fraction is normal, you have scar, you have ischemia, you're susceptible to these rhythms, which if they are not 
cardioverted, the heart will deplete itself of energy. You'll have nothing left to the point where you are asystolic and flatline. That's sudden cardiac death, and that's what's accounting for the majority of those 350,000 deaths per year. Who is going to have this? Very interestingly, here's the number of events. For the people who meet guidelines for ICDs, they're highest at risk, but they're going to account for the fewest sudden cardiac death episodes in our country. The majority of the people who are going to die suddenly are you and I. We don't even know we have cardiac disease, but maybe we do. And we're going to drop dead, and that's going to account for almost 300,000 of those deaths. And we'll leave 50,000 for the people who actually meet criteria for defibrillators. So we're always trying to guess who these people are and recommend this therapy to them, and um, it can indeed be life-saving. So I like this graph. If we think the iceberg represents all the people who have sudden cardiac death this year, everyone below the water doesn't qualify for an ICD by our guidelines. Everyone above the water does qualify, and of those, only 20% are actually going to get a defibrillator. So it's an undertreated population and problem um, in North America, which you know, behooves us to implant patients who do meet guideline criteria because they are um, highest at risk and people do, in fact, um, succumb to this. So ICD indications. <clears throat> you know, we see patients fast, our clinics are packed, volumes are high. When do you think about ICDs? Without going through all the trials, someone with ischemic cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, if their ejection fraction is less than 35%, despite at least three months of optimal drug therapy, and provided that they are at least 40 days beyond their most recent heart attack, they are eligible for defibrillator therapy and should receive. So we have a patient on Four River right now who's had a depressed ejection fraction 20% for the last six months, but comes in on this admission with an end STEMI. Does he meet guideline criteria for an ICD? No because he's within a 40-day period of his myocardial infarction. And why did the guidelines say that you should wait more than 40 days? What the trials show that is that post-infarction, you are likely to die as a complication of your infarction, such that the defibrillator and the arrhythmia is not sufficiently life-saving in that context. So here enter the life vest. Wear a life vest until you're 40 days post MI, then we implant you with a defibrillator. He also has bradycardia needs a pacemaker, and so you see how the muddies water. Should we implant a pacemaker or a defibrillator to address the um, ventricular tachycardia? But that's the way the field looks at it, and that's the framework that we use when we look at an individual and try to see if they meet um, guideline criteria. Then obviously anyone who's had a ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation arrest warrants a defibrillator in the event that that, event, in, in the event that, that um, dangerous rhythm occurs again. So here is somebody who, relatively healthy, postal worker, fit and trim, delivered mail every day, had a sudden cardiac death event in his bed. His wife gave him CPR. He made it to hospital. He got a single chamber defibrillator, which is appropriate for him because he doesn't need pacing. This is the defibrillator unit. It's bigger than a pacemaker. I have the same implant criteria. I want this over the lung field so that the arm isn't interacting with it. And patients appreciate that. A single lead, now on the lead you'll see this thick thing which is the shock coil. So should he develop an arrhythmia, this guy charges up and between the shock coil and the can as we say, there'll be a large volt of electricity just set the heart rhythm completely to normal. This can then provide Brady pacing if you need a while to pick up and this therapy um, can be life, life saving. So secondary prophylaxis for sudden cardiac death this is the simple single chamber ICD, the um, most basic device that is available. But the field is moving at warp speed, as you know. Um, first of all, I'll just say Boston developed the smallest ICD, which is their new mini. We implanted the first one in eastern Washington for this rhythm. Here's somebody in normal rhythm, develops PVCs, goes into polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and needs a shock, which is life-saving. So they get the single chamber mini ICD, which um, we were happy to implant. Patients five foot one tall, they're very small. These devices actually start to look big in someone that size. And having this option is a very um, nice feature. And we also have subcutaneous ICDs. So you need protection from a defibrillator, but you don't need pacing. 
your QRS is narrow, you're not going to need upgrade to a CRT. Do you need a device in your blood vessels in your heart on the order of years that can cause problems? We now have the subcutaneous ICD which fits under your skin. It doesn't actually go through your blood vessels into your heart, provides you with all the protection of a regular defibrillator. And we've been implanting these at Cadillac. And here's the device here. It's on your side under your skin, all outside your rib cage. And then the ICD lead comes across up the front but just under your skin, outside your body. So should that device ever have complications, it's very easy to remove, leave the vasculature and the heart untouched, as we say. Uh, so it's exciting to have this option for the very young patients who you're very reluctant to place hardware endovascularly, where in the long run it can cause complications. So far the device can't pace, so should they need a pacemaker, you don't have that option available to you. But, you know, if you lived in my shoes and saw people coming in device clinic who've had ICDs for 10, 20 years. It paces them less than 1% of the time. They've never had an arrhythmia, but they continue to meet criteria for that device. You're like, well, that's someone who should have gotten a subcutaneous <coughs> ICD. So if we can predict those people a priori, we can offer them that less invasive um, therapy, which is very exciting. Or this patient, we were gonna implant a regular defibrillator. He had total venous occlusion on the left side and on the right side. There was no option to um, implant a lead endovascularly. It was actually, we had um, asked Medtronic to support our case. They said, sorry, you don't have the technology for us. We'll have to um, reschedule. We'll make it up to you. Um, <laughs> let's, so let's move on and talk about um, resynchronizing therapy. So when are we doing bi-V devices, whether it's a pacemaker or a defibrillator? You know, you may see us measuring the QRS, trying to decide if this is the right person, even up to the time of their implant. When is it best to make that defibrillator actually a resynchronizing pacemaker or to make a single lead pacemaker actually a resynchronizing pacemaker, meaning it's pacing the heart from both sides? The way I explain it to my patients is you have bundle branch block. It takes a long time for the electrical signal to spread across your heart to tell the muscle to contract. So one side starts contracting even before the other side knows to begin. And as a result, you have this very discoordinated contraction. If the heart can't synchronize, it really has very little chance of recovering. And that's why your EF has stayed so low, you know, at least partly. So that becomes the case in the setting of a resynchronizing defibrillator in the setting of a resynchronizing pacemaker we know that the heart doesn't like a lot of pacing in the ventricle so if your EF is already somewhat compromised you're 50 percent or lower and going south and if that person is going to need a device that will pace them a lot in the ventricle it's better for them at the time of implant to have a resynchronizing pacemaker with both an LV and an RV lead so we're guessing what the physiology of that person will be downstream and trying to make that correct um, device choice for them upstream. So here we go. It looks just like a regular defibrillator, a lead in the right ventricle. And here you see this lead through the coronary sinus out to the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Now we can pace from here and we can pace from here, help that heart coordinate. So they come with a large left bundle branch block greater than 130. This means they need resynchronizing. And if we resynchronize them appropriately, you'll see that bundle branch block becomes a right bundle branch block. What was going down is now going up, which was now going slowly towards the left lateral wall, is now coming away from the left lateral wall as we make that the earliest chamber to activate. So what used to be latest is now earliest, and the heart resynchronizes, and we expect um, a nice clinical response. And the cases, if you were in my clinic and could see the pa patients come back, um, it really is, it really is very exciting. The responses to resynchronization therapy that we see, and it's exciting to consent someone for these procedures because you can say this is going to make you feel better and live longer. You know, 80% chance that we're successful. So, you know, the defibrillator sits in the background waiting for you to have a catastrophic event, but it's not going to make you feel better. This has a chance to really turn around patients' lives, and you feel very good about consenting them and encouraging them to undergo um, resynchronizing therapy. As you know from the lab, placement of the LV lead is the tricky part of the procedure and determines our procedure length of time. Cardiac monitoring, just cardiac monitoring, another revolutionary 
aspect of our field, which is very exciting. Historically, you could have a 24 to 72 hour holter. You could do an ambulatory monitor up to 30 days. And beyond that, if you wanted to monitor someone, it was an implantable loop recorder. Amazing technology that got 85% smaller this past February when the small reveal link uh, loop recorder was approved by the FDA. We have planted the first in Washington and we are the highest volume center in Washington state to date because we recognize the value of this technology and use it appropriately. And we have hospital administration that can accelerate our contracting process and um, keep us on the, up, to, up to speed. So when I was in, you know, last year, when all we had was this, I implanted a bunch of these because they really give you great information. Um, implanting these is much more exciting and much faster. And um, it was very easy to convince a patient to accept this. Showing them this is um, really transformational as they understand how easy, how easy it can be to have you know everything about their heart rhythm. So we can program them to sense. All they do is sense, but you can set whatever tachy or Brady zone you want, and you can, turn, tell you, you can tell it to tell you about atrial fibrillation. How much are you having? How fast does your heart go during atrial fibrillation? How long are your episodes? When do they start? When do they stop? Get all that information from the loop recorder. Somebody can have an MRI, any MRI. The battery lasts for three years. You can report symptoms to the monitor, and even if you do nothing, that monitor will report any concerning event to our office every 24 hours, which um, is a really a phenomenal monitoring capability and challenges us with, with how much data we're now inundated with, um, which is another challenge. But, um, <laughs> but we're rising to that challenge. So how does the pace make, how does the loop recorder detect AFib? Very much the way you or I do. It looks at the ECG and it sees that irregularly irregular pattern that we all recognize, only it quantifies it mathematically. So unlike most pacemakers, to recognize AFib, the loop recorder does not need to know what the atrium is doing. It doesn't need a lead in the atrium. It does it all on the irregular pattern of ventricular activation, which it can detect and quantify mathematically using a Lorenz plot. If you just, calc if you just plot the difference in the RR intervals versus themselves, you'll get a very disorganized looking plot, which the device will then diagnose as atrial fibrillation. <coughs> Sounds um, intriguing. In fact, it works just as well as a Holter monitor in every regard, so the data is very accurate. And um, you can trust that it's in fact reporting atrial fibrillation to you reliably. We implanted the first of these in Washington on March 24. And the beauty of it, and this slide illustrates it, is that it is subcutaneous. So we do this in our procedure room, not even in the cath lab. It's a little skin incision. And then with this plastic delivery system, you just slide that under the skin. Here you can see it fully advanced. This is the loop recorder here sitting in the cartridge. And with a plunger, we're just going to push that out subcutaneously, remove the plastic trochanter, hold pressure to stop bleeding, put a drop of surgical glue, the patient goes home 30 days later, we have every beat of their heart for the next three years um, on our monitoring system. So remarkable <coughs> technology. Here's the programming that we do in the lab. That's the, that's the signal that the device sees immediately at the time of implant. You just want it to be greater than 0 0.2 millivolts. And then we can program that to report to us information to help us understand our patient. We program it based on what we are looking for um, in that individual. And so you see us always toying with, with the programming. These look um, very inconspicuous. Here is immediately post-implant, seven days, two weeks, and three months. You can't see the device contour. You can hardly see the scar. Um, it's really very inconspicuous, which has, which has allowed us to do monitoring and many very young patients that I can't present here. We have a fair number of 20 and 30 year olds in our clinic with loop recorders, and it's nice to be able to offer them that. So lots of room to get creative. The FDA says you can implant these in a very large cohort of people. Anyone with transient symptoms, dizziness, palpitation, syncope, chest pain, anything that can, that can suggest a cardiac arrhythmia per the FDA can have a loop recorder. Patients with syndromes or situations that increase the risk for arrhythmia. If you're concerned about an arrhythmia, you are authorized to go looking for it with a loop recorder. 
in your own mind if you think you cannot capture this within 30 days of an external monitor and it warrants seeking out, the loop recorder becomes your option. Here's an interesting piece of information that's opened up a potential for cardiologists to um, collaborate with our neurology colleagues, and that is the crystal AF study. We all know that patients with atrial fibrillation can have stroke, right? But what do you do with the patient who comes to you with a stroke? You work them up, there's no cause for the stroke, and they have no diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. If you go looking for atrial fibrillation with a loop recorder, you're gonna find it in 30% of those people with your loop recorder, and that's gonna change your management to a blood thinner from an antiplatelet agent. How long will it take you to find that atrial fibrillation? On average, 84 days, but you have three years to go looking for it. So this is atrial fibrillation working backwards. You know, usually the person presents us with AFib, we say we have to protect you against stroke. Here's someone presenting to you with stroke, and you're like, we have to go look for the AFib that probably caused that. And the loop recorder gives you the opportunity to do that. Continuous monitoring won't miss a single drop of AFib um, and help you make your diagnosis. I use these a lot in my clinical practice for monitoring AFib response to therapy. I know they have AFib. It's a real problem for them, and I need to know how successful my treatments are, whether that's an antiarrhythmic drug or an ablation. Did we really slow down your heart rate? Did we really get, a, get rid of the AFib? And if we think we did, how long is it going to be until you start to have a recurrence? And is that recurrence significant? And if it is significant, is the patient recognizing it? It um, becomes very important. The loop recorder takes all the guesswork out of that process and um, makes my clinic follow-ups um, very efficient, very effective, and um, the patients appreciate the level of detail that's available. So here's a nice example just to show you how this looks from my end. I know you're always there when we're implanting these things. 64-year-old man referred to us because he had permanent atrial fibrillation and they wanted us to put in a pacemaker and ablate his AV node. He had a lot of fatigue from his AFib, presumably. The permanence of the AFib was not well established. So we put in the big loop recorder and loaded him with an antiarrhythmic drug. In the presence of a drug, his atrial fibrillation was in fact paroxysmal. We were able to demonstrate symptomatology from his AFib, which justifies us to then go to ablation. And quite by luck, we really eliminated that AFib. He was completely non-inducible at the end of our study and hasn't had a whiff of AFib since, and we've continued the monitoring since the time of that ablation. So in the presence of the loop recorder, you can um, dramatically um, change your approach to the management of the patient. And with that information, you can confidently make management decisions that you wouldn't be able to make if you didn't have that um, information. That's the big picture. So this is the kind of data that you get when you're back in the clinic. 35% AFib burden from December to March, you know, so three, four months of monitoring. So you really know over an extended period of time what's happening. You get a sense of what that patient's heart rate is like during sinus rhythm. But then when he's in AFib, you get exactly how much rate control you're having. You can tell that that is truly atrial fibrillation. No one would doubt that. So you trust, you trust the, the um, diagnostic information you're presented with. And then you can see, when does his AFib episode start? 40% of his episodes are starting at 9 o'clock at night. And his wife is like, that's exactly it. I, he fades, I lose him reliably at 9 o'clock at night. So you can say, well, that's perfect. That means your AFib is, in fact, symptomatic, even though you don't even recognize it to be atrial fibrillation. You know, it's, in fact, wiping you out. And if we were able to correct this, we could improve uh, your quality of life. So it gives you the justification that you need to go to work. There's our cardinal map from his ablation, and um, quite randomly, his AFib stopped and we were ablating complex signals <coughs> anterior to his left atrial appendage, where you know we go looking on most of our cases. The AFib stopped, and after that, we paced aggressively in his top chamber in the presence of isopril without no AFib, couldn't get it started. The chamber wouldn't fibrillate, and at follow-up, he has no AFib. There's, the there's all of his AFib leading up to the ablation. We ablate. He sputters a few times and then absolutely nothing. And if you extend this out even a year further, I have that slide, um, he's had absolutely zero. So a very satisfying result that's 
we're enabled to pursue and prove that we have achieved with the technology that's um, become available to us even in the past couple of years. For the hospitalists, the question we're always asking is how much AFib justifies anticoagulation? Here's a graph that suggests that answer. CHAD score and your duration of AFib. If you are CHADS 1, AFib greater than 24 hours should be anticoagulated. Greater than 5 minutes and 24 hours doesn't need it, but if you're CHADS 2, even 5 minutes of AFib deserves anticoagulation. If you're CHADS 3 or above and we've seen AFib but we haven't seen any for a long time, you should be on anticoagulation because the risk of recurrence and the risk of stroke resulting from that is um, high enough. So a nice picture to have in the back of your mind, anyone who's greater than CHADS 1, even five minutes of AFib documented by a pacemaker symptomatically, whatever it is, um, is deserving of anticoagulation um, to present that devastating consequence of a stroke. So to justify the link, I think it saves dollars. I think AFib management is improved. I think patients with the um, loop recorders have fewer emergency room visits. And I get a sense that I implant fewer pacemakers and defibrillators um, because the loop recorders allow me not to do that and um, spare patients from having those um, larger devices. We like loop recorders. They're efficient and effective. I have all the information on someone's AFib even before I walk in the door to meet someone. There, I, there I'm just asking them questions to confirm what I know already, which actually puts me in a very powerful position. We can do patient-specific AFib management. We can manage stroke, and I think we're improving our patient satisfaction, which compensates for those shorter office visits that we're constrained to. Um, and um, really, the monitors do represent an unprecedented opportunity for rhythm monitoring. We can really rethink our AFib management. We can collaborate with our neurology colleagues to help them solve their problems. Our patients are satisfied. I think we're conserving resources and our patients in this day and age deserve more than our best guess as to what um, their underlying arrhythmia burden and profile looks like. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. You guys are great.